Hi. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to the 2023 Wyndham Campbell Prizes Festival. Glad to have you here. I'm in a little bit of denial that I need progressive lenses, so I have to switch. I'm not old. Um, it's really great to have you all here. It's really great to have you all here uh, in person. Um, before we start, I just want to acknowledge uh, that the Yale University and the Wyndham Campbell Prizes acknowledge that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shattuck, Golden Hill, Pagasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. Um, so this is our 11th group of prize recipients, our ninth in-person festival. Uh, we had to cancel one during the pandemic and hosted um, another online, and it's really just great to be, you know, back here and feel like everything is normal-ish. Um, and uh, over the next few days, we're going to have nonstop events starting at about 10 o'clock in the morning at our tent on Cross Campus. Uh, we'll have free food all day long, so please come eat and enjoy the readings and the conversations and uh, uh, everything that's happening during the day in the tent. In the evenings, we'll move inside a little bit, so we'll be having events on the mezzanine in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. We'll be having some film screenings over in the Humanities Quadrangle. We'll be having a couple of uh, special events each evening uh, in, this, in this room here. Everything's free and open to the public, first come, first serve, so we hope to see you all um, at as many events as uh, you can get to. Um, when he passed in 2010, Donald Wyndham left a will containing an extraordinary gift to Yale University to establish the Wyndham Campbell Prizes in honor of his lifelong partner, Sandy Campbell. The prizes were, quote, made to be annually, I'm sorry, to be made annually in, the, in amounts sufficient to provide each recipient with the resources to maintain the recipient comfortably for one year to pursue his or her writing without having to be concerned about outside support. Thanks to his generosity, each year we give out eight awards valued at $175,000 apiece. Over the past decade, the prize has been awarded to 91 writers representing more than 20 nationalities. Um, so to make this festival and this prize process happen, we have, it, it takes a whole uh, lot of people and institutions. So I want to say a few thank yous before we get our uh, prize ceremony rolling. Um, I'd like to thank a lot of our uh, partners around campus, the Asian American Cultural Center, uh, Atticus Bookstore and Cafe, uh, Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, the Black Feminist Collective, Cooperative Arts and Humanities High School, the Council on African Studies, David Geffen School of Drama at Yale, the Department of African American Studies, the Department of Comparative Literature, the English Department, the Native American Cultural Center, the Office of New Haven and State Affairs, the Office of the President, Theater Studies, the Whitney Humanities Center, uh, WSHU Public Radio, our media sponsor this year, uh, the Yale Center for British Art, the Yale Creative Writing Program, Yale University Art Gallery, uh, the Yale Review, who will publish a special each issue featuring uh, this year's prize recipients uh, in December, I believe. Um, also, Yale University Press, who will publish uh, a version of this evening's talk uh, sometime next year, and they will publish last year's talk in about six months' time. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our partners at the uh, Yale conferences and events, especially Madison uh, Capobianco, the director and staff of the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and our incredible program manager, Megan Eckerly. Um, yeah, give them all a hand. There's more. <laughs> Each year, the prize recipients are selected after a year-long process involving 60 nominators, 12 jurors, and nine members of a selection committee, all of whom work anonymously. So I'd like to give them a hand as well uh, for doing this work for us. You may be sitting next to one and not even know it. Um, Lastly, um, before I bring him to the stage, I want to uh, give a special thanks to Peter Salve. Um, 
Uh, Peter has been with us to present the awards every year since the first year, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, he recently said he's going to step down, and uh, we're going to miss him uh, on, this, uh, on this evening. Um, and we can only hope that the next president is as uh, generous with his time uh, as you've been. So thank you, Peter. Um, <laughs> and we have a gift. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, it, it will be 11 years as president, and uh, it'll be my 42nd year on campus. And I'm looking forward to some more. So uh, I'm not going anywhere, and I'll be in the audience for these kinds of uh, festivities, and uh, won't have to practice pronouncing anybody's name, and they <laughs> have some real advantages, uh, as you can see. Thank you for uh, the T-shirt. I will wear it to dinner tonight. Uh, um, unless I'm stopped by my staff first for, from doing so. Um, Michael, I do want to say your stewardship of uh, uh, this festival and these prizes and uh, in general your work at Beinecke uh, Rare Book and Manuscript Library um, uh, is wonderful, provides great, uh, uh, a great contribution to our university and I know changes the lives of very creative people, and uh, it's my pleasure to just be a, uh, a part of it. I also want to thank uh, Griel Marcus, who will be our speaker in just a few minutes, um, helping us celebrate uh, these awards uh, uh, by uh, giving a keynote address, and I know we're all looking forward uh, to that. Uh, to be, I'm a psychologist, and so uh, I'm around talented and creative people, but not like this, not, like, not in these domains, that's for sure. Writers, poets, playwrights. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, being here. How many? 91, uh, did you say? We, 91. 91 over the last uh, uh, decade. Tonight uh, and through the festival, we get to meet you on your own terms, hear about the world through your eyes, and uh, uh, be able to experience. Um, what it is in a way that you experience that, that uh, motivates you to produce the creative works that you, that you do. And I think this is incredibly important. You know, my, my welcoming address to our first year students this year was called Slow Down and Fix Things. And it was a little bit of a play on Mark Zuckerberg's famous uh, line kind of mission for Facebook when he first started, which was move, move fast and break things. And, you know, uh, I meant no disrespect, and, uh, uh, you know, pe people were coming up to me afterwards and saying, you really dissed Silicon Valley, didn't you? you know, <laughs> I'm not dissing anybody. I'm just saying there's a, a place for uh, a pause, for a moment, uh, you know, in a world that's kind of breathless a lot of the time, in a media climate uh, that... Um, while making the world feel smaller and more interconnected, uh, social media in particular, um, and while generating data uh, of a kind that maybe no human could create, for better or for worse, um, still moves very quickly and still doesn't allow a lot of time for reflection. And uh, it is just the kind of work that our prize winners do that um, is a bit of a, uh, a correction to all, to all of that. Um, we, in this very fast-paced world, can feel disoriented. We can feel frightened. We can sometimes feel angry. Uh, we can feel uh, alienated. We can feel enemy. Uh, but um, literature and creativity of all kinds, they force us a little bit to slow down. Right? They force us to experience life at a human pace, on a human scale. It's not an accident that these are the arts and humanities fields that uh, we are honoring tonight. Um, we can maybe look past uh, the way in which our world is so mediated uh, by social media and instead actually look into each other's eyes. 
and listen to each other's voices and uh, find a different kind of understanding. Um, I, I, I work in a field where we quantify everything. These are kind of hard things to quantify. Uh, that's probably good. Uh, but uh, I also work in a field where uh, in my lab we uh, basically came up with the idea of an emotional intelligence uh, 33 years ago. And uh, well, I believe that uh, involving oneself in great literature, I say that broadly speaking, uh, is one way in which we can cultivate an emotional intelligence, particularly once we're already an adult uh, uh, and uh, no longer uh, going to school, or may not be going to school. Well, two emotionally intelligent adults uh, are, are, their names are on this prize, Donald Wyndham and Sandy Campbell, his partner. And uh, we are so grateful to them for establishing this award and then deciding Yale was the place uh, that was best able to steward it. Uh, it is an incredible honor uh, to be a part of that process. I think uh, their award, their name on this award, says that um, uh, their love for each other, their love for the written world, motivates a kind of legacy that they're the prize that they name honors. And it doesn't just honor them, and it doesn't just honor Yale University. And I think it's fair to say it doesn't just honor you and the 91 recipients uh, who have received this award. It certainly does those things, but it also honors the world and the human creative process that uh, uh, we are lucky enough to experience in this world. So to this year's recipients, congratulations. Welcome to Yale. Welcome to the Yale family. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> now for one of the moments that you've all been waiting for, we're going to present uh, the prizes. Uh, do you want to describe the prize uh, before I or show the prize before I present it? It, Take a picture of it on your iPhone and send it to your mom. <laughs> I know my mother would have loved to have received something like that and <laughs> would have texted back, but how come you didn't go to medical school? <laughs> okay, Darren Anderson, our first prize winner, with divinatory attention, Darren gives voice to the testimony of objects and geographies, chronicling the passage of individual memory as it turns into a community's archive and sustaining myth. Darren Anderson. In its mordant humor and philosophical skepticism, Percival Everett's virtuosic body of work exemplifies fiction's capacity for play, vigilance, and compassion for life's pre <laughs> precarity in an uncertain world. Percival. Can you tell these citations were not written by me? They were written by a scholar of the humanities. I have a feeling that might be Michael. <laughs> no, no. The judges. The judges. Alexis Pauline Gums, the luminous visionary poetry that Alexis writes emerges from urgent realities of the present 
and haunting voices of the past to imagine alternative worlds shaped by radical listening, compassion, and love. Fierce, fresh, and funny, Jasmine Lee Jones's iconoclastic plays reinvigorate the vernacular of contemporary theater for a new generation. Ling Ma meditates on urban anime with wry humor and subversive imagination, brilliantly bending and blending genre to plumb the depths of her character's origins, displacement, and alienation. Nuanced characters and trenchant stories in Dominique Moriso's plays strike at the heart of the most pressing conversations facing African Americans today, embodying a steadfast belief in the transformative power of love and art. Noticing as the stage fills up, our choreography gets a little more intricate. <laughs> DG Nanook Okpik's lapidary poems sound the depths of language and landscape, shuttling between the ancient past and the imperiled present of Inuit Alaska in a searching meditation on ecology and time. and Susan Williams, who chronicles imperial legacies with a forensic eye, a historical mind, and a decolonial sensibility for African agency. Her findings are as stunning as they are transformative. photographer, Bea Wolfstein. <laughs> so if you would join me in a final round of congratulations for everyone on this stage today. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
So the Wyndham Campbell Lecture is delivered each year by a distinguished writer to commemorate not only the achievements of the prize recipients, but the art of writing itself. Yale University Press publishes an expanded version of the lecture under its Why I Write imprint. This year's speaker, Griel Marcus, will be introduced by the William R. Keenan, Jr. Professor of African American Studies, American Studies, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Music, Daphne Brooks. Daphne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got a mask on because I'm immunocompromised, so I'm living that life. But I am thrilled to be out in the world with you and to be here for this just extraordinary occasion. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you for your work. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you today in order to introduce Grail Marcus, Grail Marcus, the pioneering rock critic, culture critic, American studies scholar, and my fellow Bay Area native, whose many, many books and articles stretching across the last half century have, it's safe to say, invented a new language and logic about American life, and in particular, its deep and ravishing entanglements with a vast and varied musical cosmos. His is a style and critical approach to storytelling that remains altogether singular and unmatched in its ability to grip and transport you deep into the fabric of both, uh, both long-forgotten sounds and well-known classics. His work gets us closer to lost musical vagabonds and fiercely beloved icons, rendering this music, these people, altogether new and transformed. Vivid and arresting, Griel Marcus's writing carries us to the places where objects and characters are caught up in the run of histories which are hidden in plain sight from us, made visible by way of his sharp, gripping, penetrating, and dazzling prose. Like so many others of my generation who harbored youthful dreams of writing our ideas and feelings about music, I have learned so much from the form and content, the fortitude and the conviction, the power and wonder of Grail Marcus's body of work. Maybe I was destined to follow the magnificent trail he set for me in my generation. I'm talking about my generation. Um, af <laughs> after all, I'm not even a Who fan, but after all, we come from the same Palo Alto adjacent town, the city of Menlo Park, California, went to the same high school, Menlo Atherton High, where Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham walked the halls before going their own way with Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> we went to the same university, California Berkeley, where Marcus and his peers, along with local music critics like the legend Ralph J. Gleason, would shepherd into being the sophistication of a new form, rock and roll criticism. The path was set by Grail Marcus, and I found myself on it, chasing the magic of this prose of his that captured the essence of these sounds, its youthful desires and utopic possibilities born out of a dispossessed people's will to survive in this country and picked up by a new left counterculture generation, reimagining what this nation was made for, what they envisioned it could be. So how best to sum up the magnitude of his impact? the scale of what Griel Marcus has gifted to us in the form of books that read like page-turning, picaresque adventures, transporting detective stories, rapturous romance tales, and panoramic odes to works of art, social, historical, and political moments, to places thick with memory, and to an electrifying array of strange and beautiful genius people. When I first came up from Princeton, this is where I first met Griel when I was on the faculty there, to teach a class here at Yale back in 2008. I had it in my mind that starting with lipstick traces, Griel's instant classic bomb throw of a, of a text from 1989 that shook the foundations of rock criticism and altogether rearranged the critical playing field. I had it in my mind that starting my undergraduate seminar by assigning the daunting lipstick traces was the way to go. The late great mammoth of a music critic in his own right, my dearly beloved friend Greg Tate, happened to be on campus that day and dropped in on my class. He discovered a room full of students bravely toiling over and wrestling with the puzzles and conundrums strewn across this astonishing book. 
Afterwards, Tate put his arm around my shoulder and laughed as if to say, baptism by fire, baby. <laughs> you started them with lipstick traces, D? Not Mystery Train or one of his other bangers, he continued. You made them go all the way in. Here is what it's like to go all the way in with Griel Marcus. It means staying alert for the presence of mystery, walking through the doorway to a better world as he puts it in those opening pages of Mystery Train, his 1975 inaugural tome, now in its sixth edition. It's a book that drops us out of an airplane down into a world built by performers who take the music as self-making potential, as community-building radicalism, as kaleidoscopic democratic art that goes to the edge and has us speaking in tongues opening the door to underground laboratories of mischief and quiet revolt, catching backstage mayhem, the calamitous crowds, the chaos and the wonder of rock and roll life announcing itself, following the trail of an entire complex of values, a whole way of being in the world. This is the Grail Marcus way, building equations out of figures swallowed up by history and icons who embodied history, and envisioning for us enchanting scenarios wherein an overlooked blues woman genius breaks bread with a future Seattle rock legend in the crowd of an Elvis show. He takes us through the dizzying portals, chasing an idea, a feeling, a spirit, the mystical, the ephemeral, the ineffable. He maps out for us asymmetrical affinities, surprising social intimacies, and wakes us up to the detritus of history. Everything old is new again on this midnight train of his, this train on which genres and methods are broken, not a history, not a purely musical analysis or a set of personality profiles, as he puts it in Mystery Train, and shaped into new forms of critical narration that might take us towards key American truths. He weaves together a voluminous body of cultural details into stories about musicians that rise to the level of myth, dissecting the anatomy of a song, the long twisted surprising and often subversive biography of a song and the tricksters who bring this music to life. More than a storyteller, Griel Marcus is a scene maker, a channeler of our modern history, the discursive cinematic eye to our epic tale of America's riotous fits and starts, modern cultures dormant and then alive again, tiny revolutions full of negationist pranks, fatalism and desire, acceptance and rage, populated by punks and Dadaists, outlaws and soothsayers, prophets and hucksters, shamans and thieves. He untangles fables for us and weaves together fresh winds that hold our attention and defamiliarize our broken world. Griel Marcos was born in San Francisco in 1945. He lives across the bay in Oakland with his wife, Jenny, woman he met the week John F. Kennedy was assassinated. He graduated from the University of California at Berkeley in 1967, where he was lucky to study with Michael Rogan, John Schur, Norman Jacobson, and Lars Rzef. Since 2000, he has taught at Berkeley, Princeton, the New School, the University of Minnesota, and the Graduate Center in New York. He is the author of many books, to name a few, including Mystery Train, Lift Traces, The Dustbin of History, Invisible Republic, AKA the Old Weird America, one of my dearly beloved favorites, Double Trouble, The Manchurian Candidate, The Shape of Things to Come, Prophecy in the American Voice, The History of Rock and Roll in 10 Songs, Under the Red, White and Blue, Patriotism, Disenchantment, and the Stubborn Myth of the Great Gatsby, and last year's Folk Music, a Bob Dylan biography in seven songs. With Sean Wilentz, he is the editor of the Rosenbrier, Death, Love, and Liberty, an American Ballad, and with Werner Solers of A New Literary History of America. What a pleasure to have Grill Marcus back with us today here in the round at Yale. Please join me in giving the warmest of welcomes to the one and only Grill Marcus.
Daphne has given me a lot to live up to. <laughs> so I'll try. Do my best. I come here with thanks to the Wyndham Campbell Foundation for the legacy that they have established and for all those who've benefited from it. And with thanks to John Donatich of Yale University Press and Michael Kelleher of the Wyndham Campbell Foundation for inviting me here to give this talk. I'm honored to be in the presence of this year's recipients of the Wyndham Campbell Prize. And I hope what I have to say will only elevate their magnificent achievements. I write for fun. I write for play. I write for the play of words. <coughs> A right to discover what I want to say and how to say it, and the nerve to say it. The key word for me isn't fun, isn't play, but it's discover. I live for those moments when something appears on the page as if of its own volition, as if I had nothing to do with what is now looking at me in the face. In 1965, Bob Dylan described his song, Like a Rolling Stone, as 20 pages of vomit. <laughs> later, he said, well, maybe 10 pages. <laughs> but much later, almost 50 years later, he described it very differently. It's like a ghost is writing a song like that, he said. It gives you the song, and then it goes away. Now that's a very evocative, very romantic account of what anyone who engages in any sort of creati creative activity experiences at any time. For a lot of people, that sense of a genie granting you a wish, even if you never ask for it, that sense of visitation is what it's all for, that moment of inexplicable clarity when you put the music with words and things together, the songs just make themselves. The 1950s New Orleans pianist, Huey Piano Smith, once said, after you listen on it, he said of putting things together, it says something of its own self, as if you hadn't planned. Talking about stand-up comedy, Richard Belzer said the same thing. The greatest thing for me, he said, is when I make the audience laugh in a moment that could only happen that night with that audience. And he's talking about that single moment when what you're writing or painting, singing, telling, speaks in its own voice, which is and isn't yours. Sometimes, he says, I laugh with the audience because I'm hearing the joke the same time that they are. The, the feeling of, no, I didn't think that. I didn't write that. Where did that come from? And I mean that literally, absolutely having no memory of creating, composing, fashioning with what is there before you, saying, all right, here it is. What are you going to do with this? That's what I write for, for those moments. Writing is not only an odd craft at keeping company with ghosts giving you songs and visitations giving you words. People may say to other people or to themselves that they want to become a writer as if it's a status or a profession where you get a degree and then you're a writer. Writers write. They can't help it. They can't not. At some point, defeated, without readers, or without a subject, without something that to them calls out to be put into the world, they might give up. Then they aren't writers. People sometimes ask writers when they're going to retire. You don't retire from writing any more than you retire from breathing. Perhaps at a certain point you can't do it anymore. For some people what stops them from writing is whatever what stops them 
from breathing. For 10 months last year, that was how I lived. For 10 months, I didn't write a word that wasn't on my phone. And I couldn't believe how easy it was. Writing is rooted in memory, in some alchemy of responses, particular to everyone, with no one's translation of life the same. My writing is d rooted in a double memory. It's a memory of an actual incident, but inside that memory is a false memory, an attempt to remember something that can't be found. I was 10 in 1955. My family had just moved into a new house in Menlo Park, now famous as the headquarters of Facebook, then famous for nothing. <laughs> in our house, in a library room where you could squirrel yourself off from everybody else, there was a big tube radio, a big console, and I'd play with it at night, trying to pull in drifting AM stations from across the country, Salt Lake City, Cincinnati, even dance bands from some hotel in New Jersey, as if that made some kind of loop back to where I was. And one night, a few lines came out. When American GIs left Korea, the radio said, they left behind countless fatherless babies. Once everybody talked about this, now nobody cares. Those words bothered me at the time, but I put them out of my mind, or so I thought. For the next 20 years, that radio incident would reappear, crashing into whatever I was, think whatever I was thinking like an invisible meteorite. And as I got older, I realized this was the echo of something other than what the words on the radio actually described. I knew it was an echo of an absent memory, a phantom memory of my own father, whose name was Greel Gersley, who was lost in a typhoon in the Pacific when his destroyer went down. Those were all of the facts that I had at the time and for so long after. No date, no details, no story. I was born Greel Gersley, but when those words came out of the radio, I wasn't Greel Gersley anymore. And all those words made an echo chamber, chamber for the memory they called up. I had nothing to remember. The memory that they called up was silent and blank. Still, we all have memories of things we didn't experience, cultural memories that have taken up residence in our minds built houses, filled them with furniture and appliances, and commandeered that we live in them. I never saw Ty Cobb or Babe Ruth play, but they were as real to me growing up as President Eisenhower. I was raised with tales of their, hego, their hero sagas, even the story of a great aunt who supposedly slept with Babe Ruth even with the fact that when I was a baseball history mad 10-year-old, Ty Cobb himself lived in Menlo Park. I knew all about how he was the meanest man in baseball. I wanted to knock on his door, but I was afraid he might spike me. <laughs> and instead, I sent him a postcard asking for an autograph, with he sent back with a signature so fresh-looking it was scary. He was really there. Many years later, I found that his door was actually open, and friends of mine were in his house all the time, asking for the stories that he was happy to tell and what I wouldn't have given to have more nerve when I was 10 years old in 1955. These sorts of memories, these cultural memories, come to us from all sources, but especially from movies. There is that blank memory, but what explained it to me, as if it lay behind it, was one particular movie, David Lynch's Blue Velvet. The famous opening of this 1986 picture seems to parody the American 
fantasy of home, peace, quiet, and appliances, the trademarked American dream. But what's most interesting about what's happening on screen is that it may, it may have no satiric meaning at all. The title sequence has so shown a blue velvet curtain swaying back in the background from some silent breeze, casting back to the black and white velvet and satin backgrounds of opening credits for 1940s B-movies. The theme music is ominous and alluring. First it suggests Hitchcock's vertigo, then a quiet setting where predictability has replaced suspense, then horns cutting off all hints of the happy ending. Bobby Vinton sings Blue Velvet, his soupy number one hit from 1963, but with the sound hovering over slats of a white picket fence with red roses at their feet, the, the song no longer sounds soupy, or for that matter, 23 years in the past. It sounds clean and timeless, just as the white of the fence and the red of the roses shot from below, so you look up at them as if you're looking up at a flag. They're so vivid you can hardly see the objects for the colors. For an instant, the, vis the viewer is both visually and morally blinded by the intensity of the familiar. Defenses are stripped away. In slow motion, a fireman on a fire engine moving down a well-kept middle-class street waves at you, a warm smile on his moon face. There's a house with a white picket fence and a middle-aged man watering the lawn. Inside the house, two middle-aged women sit on a sofa watching a TV set, a small screen set in a blonde wooden box with legs a set from the 1950s when a television set was sold as a piece of furniture. In this case, an object reflecting the values of taste and modesty, and also modest enough that the man in the yard might have made it himself. A crime picture is on the TV. And outside the man, is watering the, the man watering the lawn seems to sway with Bobby Vinton. And the camera shows the faucet where the garden hose is attached, leaking spray. The hose catches on a branch. The sound of water coming the, from the hose in the faucet rises to a rumble that seems to be coming out of the ground. Every predictable gesture is about to shatter from the pressure the predictable was meant to hide. And the man clutches his chest and he falls to the ground. A dog rushes up, plants its feet on the chest of the prone man and drinks from the spray. And the rumble grows louder, the camera goes down to the ground beneath the grass to reveal a charnel house, a secret world, an army of hideous beetles, symbols of human depravity. And the hero then finds an ear in a field, and the story that will take up the rest of the film begins. But I think it's the pastoral that stays in the mind, that not the nightmare bugs and the things are not as they seem, Watching the movie for a second or third time, you can see that the slightly stiff framing and timing of the firemen, the two bright images of fences and flowers, are not a matter of making the familiar strange, but of getting at how familiar the familiar really is. The shots play like memory, and they stay in the mind like a common memory, laying itself over whatever personal memories a person watching it might bring to these images. Because what the sequence seems to be saying is a proof that the notion of personal memory is false. The details of the sequence could perhaps be excavated, excavated to match specific details of David Lynch's own boyhood, but what's striking about these images is that nothing in them is specific to anybody. They're specific, and they're overwhelmingly specific, 
only as images of the United States. Now, anyone's memory is composed of both personal and cultural memories, and they're not separable. Memories of incidents that seem to have actually happened once in a particular time to you are colored, shaped, even determined, which is to say fixed in your memory by the affinities your personal memories have to common memories. Common memories as they were first formed from textbooks, television shows, comic books, movies, slang, clothes, all the rituals of everyday life as they are performed in one country as to po opposed to the way they're performed somewhere else. The images that open Blue Velvet are images of things anyone watching a movie made in the USA can be presumed to have seen before. In actual experience, or on TV shows, or for that matter, other movies, to have remembered as if they waved back at the fireman or picked up that hose, as if whatever makes the image significant was determined was not deter was determined by the person remembering it and nobody else but this is not true and you can take it further if personal memory is false what happens when you try to construct a memory of something that in fact you don't remember but it, that you desperately want to remember i think i always knew that the words about the Korean orphan, orphans left behind and forgotten in the United States lay behind what I ended up doing with my life, rewriting the past, pursuing an obsession with secret histories, with stories untold, with what to me were deep and fraternal connections between people who never met. Such people as in a book I wrote through the whole of the 1980s as the Dadaist Richard Holzenbeck in Zurich in 1916, the essayist Guy Debord in Paris in 1954, and the punk singer Johnny Rotten in London in 1976. Once a person interviewing me about that book asked me about some lines I'd written there Lost children seek their fathers, and fathers seek their lost children, but nobody really looks like anybody else. So all, fixed on the wrong faces, pass each other by. And he asked me if I was one of those sons or fathers. And I told him that what he was quoting was just one of those things that any writer stumbles on, that I found those lines and kept them because they made sense of what I was trying to set out at that point in the book with no personal motive, and that it was only later, rereading that passage, that I realized it was made up of the most autobiographical words in the entire 500-page book. I thought I was solving a problem on the page. I have a strong sense of privacy. In this case, I didn't want to reveal myself to myself, but instead I revealed myself to anyone who chose to read what I had written. One can, of course, remember things one hasn't experienced. Older people tell children, this is what he was like. This is the song he loved. This is how he laughed, how he walked. This is the team he rooted for. And you absorb that. And you meet the person who, in fact, you will never meet so that that person never present becomes part of your memory. But in my case, none of that was true. <coughs> I was born six months and a day after my father was killed in the Second World War. I know that now, but growing up, I never had a date to hold on to, to build from. My mother, my mother was from San Francisco, Greel Gersley in 1944, at 24, second in command on the destroyer, the Hull, was from Philadelphia. They hadn't known each other long, 
when they married that September in San Francisco. My mother went with my father to Seattle, where the hull shipped out. I was left with the name, which became for me a talisman in a mystery. In 1948, my mother remarried to a San Francisco lawyer <coughs> who grew up in San Jose, and he adopted me and my name was changed. I don't remember myself as Greel Gersley, but Greel was an inescapable name. I always had to explain it, but I really had nothing to tell. The story of the whole was not told in my family. There were no pictures of my father, Greel Gersley, in my house. When I visited my Philadelphia family, there were pictures, but I felt furtive and unfaithful <coughs> and really criminal when I looked at them, and nobody ever offered me a picture of my own to keep. There were memories. I was visiting my father's older brother and sister. There were letters to other family members. In one, he wrote about how Bing Crosby's recording of Blues in the Night was the only thing that got him through the day. There was even a professionally shot home movie showing my father in his dress navy uniform and the way he looked and the commanding, casual way he drawer, wore his dress navy cap, so much a map now for John F. Kennedy, a match, that the footage is hard to look at. But none of that was shared to me then. It may have been that to tell the story of who my father was and what he had done and what happened to him and to so many others would have been too much for a small boy to take on or that to tell me such things would be somehow a breach of faith with my new father or my mother in their new life. And the situation never changed. When I grew older, the habit of not speaking about, about the past became a kind of prison. I didn't know how to break out of it. I didn't ask. Nobody told. My younger siblings might ask my mother about what it was like to have been married to somebody else. I could never do it. Like many children, I sometimes fantasize that I was not the child of my parents, but in my case, it was at least half true, or more than half true. Though I always knew I had a different father than my brothers and my sister, if my father had lived, my mother would have never lived the life I came from. When at first I asked about my father, she would say she didn't remember. Their time together had been so short, she said. The letters he wrote from the hull, <coughs> he was in charge of censoring mail, which meant that he could say whatever he pleased. <laughs> the letters he wrote to my mother were thrown out. My mother gave her wedding book to her mother. And when, sometime in the 50s, my grandmother took it out and opened it, she told me never to tell my mother that she had shown it to me. So in times of childhood or teenage unhappiness, the fantasy that I might have lived a different life and been a different person with a different name was more than a fantasy but it was the kind of fact that when you try to hold on to it, slips through your fingers like water. So I developed my obsession with the past. I read the history books in the landmark book series from The First Men in the World by Ann Terry White in 1953 to, uh, 53 to The Witchcraft of Salem Village by Shirley Jackson in 1956 and on from there. They were hardback books. They probably cost about $1.50. I'd read one in a day, and then I'd read it again. I used the cultivated memory of my own past as a spur to reconstructing events as they happened and as they didn't happen, as they might have happened. That's always been the road I've traveled, whether writing about Elvis, Elvis Presley or Bill Clinton, Bob Dylan or Huey Long, <coughs> or the life the blues singer Robert Johnson might have lived 
if he hadn't been murdered in 1938. Events as they happened and events as they didn't, when in 1964, during the free, spe free speech movement in Berkeley, when it seemed that everybody was reading Albert Camus' The Rebel, somebody handed me a copy, a 1956 vintage paperback edition, and I was instantly transfixed. My own unintelligible sense of history, never put into words, never fixed in an image, was suddenly looking at me. A black and white drawing showed a crumpled newspaper blowing in the wind. There were unreadable headlines and stories in different languages and, and alphabets smeared on a single front page. And the picture stayed with me with more force and poetry than any sentences from the book itself. That drawing was history to me. It was life, real life as it happens, a paper flying down the street with headlines of rebellions and refusals and battles and defeats blowing out of reach. You can see someone chasing the sheet down the street as if it were the last written bit of evidence of the story of its times. Now gone with the wind, all the assassinations and massacres, all the failed social experiments and poetic negations, all the raised and dashed hopes of the century that left only in unintelligible traces in the world, which is somehow not nothing. Shahid watched his lover across the bookshop, a spacious place on two floors with the stock displayed on huge tables. In the past, bookstores had always been so dingy, Hanif Qureshi wrote in his novel, The Black Album. Seeing piles of new volumes, Shahid wanted to snatch them up, not knowing how he'd survive without them. Dee Dee bought lipstick traces and he followed her to the till, awaiting the bookmark and the bag. I never expected my untold story to actually appear as real life, to challenge as real life the fantasy that had always been the foundation for whatever it is that I write. But the story did appear about 20 years ago. My father called to say that there was a documentary on the Weather Channel about the hull. My wife was out. I watched alone. When she came back, I said, I just saw my father die. He wasn't in the film. Survivors from the hull spoke over stock footage and still photos of the typhoon that killed over 400 men from their ship and 400 men from two more ships that went down in the same storm. You saw their Navy photos as they were in 1944. You saw them now as old men laughing, stoic, crying, speaking of the men who made it into the open sea with life jackets who, when they were found, had nothing left of themselves below the waist, countless men eaten by sharks. It was the greatest disaster in the history of the United States Navy. A few years later, a writer named Bruce Henderson got in touch with me. He was looking up for information about Greel Gersley for a book on the hull. Was I perhaps named for him by a friend? Was I a distant relative? Was there anything I could tell him? The story he told based on interviews he'd conducted with the survivors and people in the orbit of the ship was terrible. The hull had been at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, but not damaged. The captain then, the man who trained my father, was respected and trusted. In Seattle, he was replaced by a martinet from Annapolis, a man so vain and incompetent, so impatient with advice from experienced officers, officers and so sure of his own right way that when the hull set out for the South Pacific, 20 men went AWOL, certain 
that to ship with this man was a death sentence. With the typhoon looming, Admiral William Halsey ordered this fleet to sail into it to see, he said, what they're made of. My grandfather, Isaac Gersley, once saw Halsey in a restaurant, and he went up to him. You killed my son, he said. With the ship trapped in a trow, the waves on each side a hundred feet high, the captain, determined, the captain determined to power the engines to full throttle and smash his way out while his officers tried to tell him that in a trow you cut the engines and you wait. The captain panicked. He issued contradictory orders, then rescinded them, then issued them again. Other officers who survived to tell the story to Bruce Henderson begged my father, who was trusted as the captain was not, admired as he was reviled, to seize the ship to place the captain under arrest, to take command, to save the ship, in other words, to lead a mutiny. And there was no mutiny, but Herman Wook was also in the typhoon and he heard the stories. The Kane mutiny was based on what happened on the hull and what might have happened. My father refused. In the history of the Navy, he said, there had never been a mutiny. He knew, he said, that if he didn't take command, he and everybody else would probably die. And if he did, and they lived, that son of a bitch will have us all hung. The ship was pitching at angles of 70 degrees, and my father was thrown against machinery, breaking ribs, bones in his hand, bones in his back, a sailor got a splint on his hand. The ship pitched over 90 degrees, and the only direction after that it was going to go was down. With the ship flooding, <coughs> my father was pulled from a hatch into the open sea. One survivor says he said to a sailor who approached him, don't try to help me, I won't make it. And another, another remembers him asking for help, and the men near him, knowing he had no chance. Long after the war, when enough time had passed for those who'd been part of it to talk about it, the survivors of the whole began to hold reunions. In December of 2006, in Las Vegas, they held what they determined would be their last, and my late older daughter went. She looked like real Gersley, as I don't. My mother, in a rare, unguarded moment, was the first to see it, and the people in Las Vegas saw it. And they told her stories, some of them as awful as the ones Bruce Henderson told, that when the original captain of the hull was told by one of the survivors that if he had still been the captain, the ship would never have gone down, he shot himself. So now I know these facts, or I've heard in second and third hand these stories. I have a story I can tell. I'm telling it now. If it were told to me when I was a child, I might have in a true sense remembered, remembered it as if I had been there with the same instantly um, instantly recallable immediacy with which I can remember and recount the exploits of Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth. But these facts severed from Hamley, family history that could have given them flesh st and still made spectral by the family life I actually lived are really no more mine than the images that open blue velvet. I can make sense of them and hold them in my mind only as scenes from movies the likes of the cruel sea, victory at sea, the documentaries, the world at war, or why we fight, or from the Hull movie that someday someone might make. But if any such movie were made, the story that I have as a personal story would be even less mine than it is now, and the truth is it isn't mine at all. 
It's a contrivance. It's a story that I might remember but don't. What might have been a personal story dissolves into the public domain of a greater story, of the war, of heroism and stupidity, of arrogance and decency, and hundreds of thousands of the dead. And in that sense, whatever personal memory might be found there, the common memory rightly takes away. And what is left one might call neurosis, or fixation, or even a haunting. And it can be used. I've used it all my life, more or less consciously, as a font of energy, as an impetus, as a way of looking at the world, why I write. For a long time, I thought it was that simple. A nice, <coughs> a nice, organized mise-en-scene that I could use as I chose. But one night this year, thinking about all this, trying to fall asleep, instead of trying to remember the capitals of the states or the A to Z streets in Minneapolis, <laughs> I began to go over words from the titles and part titles of my books and it all stared back at me like the open mouth of a nightmare killer in a horror movie. Mystery, America, Stranded, Desert Island, Traces, Secret, History, Dead, Obsession, Dustbin, Fascist, Invisible, Republic, Death, Love, Liberty, Disappearance, Forgetting, Under the Red, White, and Blue, patriotism, myth. Those words, many of them, arrived unbidden, just like the phrases that come down out of nowhere, appearing in front of me, daring to say I wrote them when I know I didn't. The words Invisible and Republic made up a book title. The publishers in the US and the UK didn't like my original title, so I wrote out a list of 20 in 10 minutes and told them to choose whatever they liked. <laughs> they both chose Invisible Republic. There was no thought involved at all. Only that ghost Bob Dylan talked about, a trickster ghost. What I write for, fun, play, discover. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Greel. Thank you, President Salovey. Thank you, Daphne. Congratulations to our prize winners. Good night, everybody. <laughs>